Thanks for joining everybody. Um, I'm Brenna. I'm going to be leading this panel tonight, uh, talking with the panelists and, um, you know, kind of having the conversation flow. Um, please feel free to pop any questions that you have in the moment in the chat. Um, I'd like for us to keep the actual conversation just to myself and to the panelists, but if you have any any questions in that moment, pop them in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on it, and if I can work it into the conversation, I will. But we do also have time for Q&A at the end where you will be able to um, speak if you're more comfortable speaking um, either way. So, um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for all the panelists. Um, we've done a little bit of prep work for this. And the first question that I want to start out with is, what's your coming out at work story? So. I know not everybody has one, right? But um, some people do. So I'm, I'm curious um, who wants to talk about their coming out at work story. I can share, Raphael, kick us off. Go for it. So uh, <laughs> I've been uh, working for, the, for the, uh, the bank for the last 25, 24 years, I should say, almost 25 years overall. Um, and it just so happened that, you know, in the 90s, when I first got hired, uh, it was a little bit, you know, different than it is today. Um, definitely, there was still a lot of stigma against uh, the homosexual um, community or the gay community or anyone in the LGBTQ group. Um, so I kept my private life that private. Um, and I think, um, obviously, a disservice to myself. But again, you know, I didn't know any, any better. I mean, throughout high school, I, I've seen people get bullied and, and me just didn't want to, you know, I, I think at one, one point I, uh, I try to intervene and, and, and then eventually I was, oh, well, you know, if you're a friend, friend of that person, because, you know, then they associate you with the individual. And I think at the end of the day, it was more of a um, disservice to myself and my community to not speak out as often as I could have, uh, because in the times that I did, you know, something negative happened to me. Yeah. So I kind of kept, kept that uh, uh, to myself and, you know, the bankers of uh, the office would have pictures of their wives, their children, their pets, and I always kept my personal life behind. And, and one day uh, a customer, you know, just came up to me and, and asked me how my weekend was. And, you know, Jeremy and I had uh, gone to Europe for, you know, about a week and a half. And I wanted to share that with, with this individual and I just did. And it was so easy for me to just communicate that information and have a conversation, open conversation with these individuals. And it was a couple, it was an elder couple. And by me opening up, they, you know, and I told them I went with my, went with my uh, significant other and they asked, oh, what is her name? And I said, oh, his name is Jeremy. And they're like, oh, well, that's good. And, you know, come to find out they happen to have a daughter who was a lesbian and they showed me pictures of her and her lover, and they became one of my best customers. Oh, that's awesome. I, I think once I was able to say it out loud and be open and accept myself for who I was, even though I've been in a relationship for 10 years, I kind of kept it away from, from my professional environment just because I didn't want to be passed out on a promotion. I didn't want to be treated differently. I think that's one of the other things as well. And it was different times. I, I think, uh, you know, um, all the strides that we've taken as a community have definitely helped uh, pave for the for the youngins uh, nowadays, and and I think uh, it was a it was a great uh, moment for me. And after that, I said to myself, you know, I felt like a relief, and I also felt like, oh my God, I, if you know, if I told my customer and they you know had such positive um, feedback, I'm just going to be myself. And then since then on I've, I've been nothing but my true authentic self that's that's awesome how long ago was that this was in 2008 so this was during the uh yeah just about 12 years ago during a uh, prop uh prop eight prop eight yeah. yeah oh cool so did that filter over into like your relationships with coworkers as well like it sounds like you started talking about it with a client how did that yes over into um, like the behind the scenes work. Exactly. So I, you know, we happen to be out on a, a on a on a corner, on a busy corner in the city of Brea, Lambert and, and Brea Boulevard, and we've had people from both uh, parties that were actually, you know, protesting Prop A and people that were for Prop A, and you know, we have to take a stand and and you know, we have to let people do what 
they have to do, right? So they were actually in opposite ends, so they didn't really involve uh, our branch. But my district manager uh, happened to find out, uh, you know, through, you know, what was going on and reached out to me because she knew that I was, you know, that I was uh, part of the LGBTQ community and she wanted to make sure that I was, that, you know, how I was feeling, how my, my, uh, me as a, per, uh, as a, as an individual and also as a manager at the time I was managing this branch, how I was feeling. And then her giving me her support just kind of meant so much to me. And then I later found out that, uh, her actual brother was, um, also part of the LGBT community. And, and these are things that had I not, you know, eventually just be myself, I would have missed out on, on, on these opportunities as well. Yeah, we're everywhere, right? <laughs> well, it kind of trickles, you know, uh, and it's funny because to this day, you know, Jeremy and I, we have a, a little Frenchie and, and I always, it's either I take her out for a walk or he takes her out for a walk. And I'm like, why can't we just both of us go together on a walk? It's like two dudes walking a little Frenchie. <laughs> That looks a little gay, Ralph, don't you think? <laughs> and I always say, hey, you know, it's 2020. We can yeah, do that. Yeah, we are, right? <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Raphael. Um, is there anybody else that wants to talk about their, their coming out story at work? I'll, I'll go. All right, Pauline. All right, so my coming out story is a little long, but I'm not going to bore everyone with the details. Um, it had several stages. Uh, it was immensely terrifying, mentally painful, and uh, but at the end, it was extremely liberating. So looking back, after having suppressed who I was for many years and finally coming to terms with it, obviously, I came out first to friends and family, and that was a total disaster. And mm -hmm. But that pretty much set the stage for how I thought the company was going to react See, when I began with the company back in 2008, uh, it was still very much a conservative company, and I didn't think they were going to be open to the idea of the first transgender person there. So I, I was totally expected to be let go. So um, I didn't, yeah, I didn't go directly to my supervisor. Like I, I hear some stories, and everyone, all the stories that I've heard in the past, they all went to their supervisor first. Instead, I went to a, a, through a different approach. I went straight to HR. And there I kind of pled my case to this rock star of an HR business partner who pretty much held my hand. And together we both navigated our way through this, uh, what was considered like new ground. Yeah. So I was, I was told that, um, that I needed to communicate my transition to the chief general counsel. And if anybody doesn't know what a chief general counsel is. There's usually like the fourth or fifth person in charge of the company. So I was like extremely nervous. Um, but the day of, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So our department reports into the legal team. So okay, got it. yeah, my boss at the time reported directly to the chief general counsel. So the day of, I had, I had written out my speech um, in its entirety on a piece of paper and I walked into his office and he was expecting me. I didn't just barge in. <laughs> I read directly from my speech and occasionally I would look up at him and he was like so attentive, just like staring at me. And I, I didn't know where this was going to go. Um, I literally had a box, an empty box underneath my, uh, my cubicle. Cause I was thinking, wow. going to let me go. I'm just going to throw all my stuff in there. I'm going to run out. But um, when I was done, it was such a relief because I think, he was a little bit more excited than I was. <laughs> he was he was giddy in a way after I told him, um, but he was also very serious. He wanted he wanted me to know and he wanted others to know how important this was not only to me, but to him and especially to the department and the company as a, as a whole. So when they saw how serious he was, um, I received overwhelming welcome. Um, almost as if I was a brand new rock star of an employee. And um, it, it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's really fascinating. You know, it's, it's, there, there's like a point to that. I think that we all go through is that fear, right? And sometimes the fear is bigger than the, the actions. Yeah. Sometimes so not, right? Fear is valid, but can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so so the fear, you know, I actually got sick because 
the day that he was going to communicate to the rest of the team, he um he wanted to do it in a, in a in our department meeting, in the entire legal department meeting. And we're talking about people that that uh, in our department where he spoke with people up in San Jose and some people overseas um, and in the other departments who usually joined our meetings. And I decided not to go to the meeting. I, I ran into my boss's office, locked the door, and I was a nervous wreck. I was, I was shaking. I felt like I wanted to throw up. Yeah. Um, and I secretly dialed in just to listen in. And it, it was somewhat funny because when he announced it, at first everyone thought that I was sick because I was obviously changing. Um, but when he announced it, everyone was quiet. And I thought, oh my God, it's not going well. I'm gonna have to run out of here. <laughs> but afterwards, um, you know, the, the, the meeting was actually right around the corner. So people were looking for me and my boss came in and goes, I found her. <laughs> I, was, I was literally hiding behind, not underneath his desk, but like behind his desk. <laughs> and then I just got a lot of hugs. Yeah. Um, and it was, I, I can't explain how scared I felt, but it was such a relief that people loved the idea and, and they were so accepting of it. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm sure that others have a, a story as well, but we have a lot of content to get through. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next story or the next question. Um, so I'm, I want to talk about how being LGBTQ plus part of the community makes us better employees. So um, does, does uh, somebody have a thought about that? How do, you, how do you bring yourself to work and be a better employee? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, I, I just think diverse teams in general, um, you know, tend to be smarter, more inclusive, more productive. There's lots of studies on, you know, cultural, ethnic, um, social backgrounds, uh, LGBTQ, bringing, you know, different backgrounds, different experiences to the workplace. And that diversity, I think, is just makes a stronger team, a better company altogether. And me being out at work, bringing my true self to work every day really is the diversity that I bring. That's, that's the part of the puzzle that I bring that's different from everybody else or several other people in my work group where I'm educating them on what it means to be LGBTQ. Um, just this morning, I had somebody who was an HR business partner um, because at JP Morgan, we are just now uh, moving pronouns to our signature lines on our emails and putting that on our internal uh, websites uh, using pronouns now as a company uh, internationally. And an HR business partner actually asked me, she goes, you know, I know we're close, we've worked together for a long time, but what does it actually mean if I put she, her, hers? Mm -hmm. And we had a great conversation about that. And she, she basically said, I feel great now understanding why it's important to have a pronoun to be inclusive and to be accepted. And that was kind of the reversal where she's an ally, but it made her a better employee just by being able to identify herself as well. Yeah, so I think, it fills her over into her life too, probably, right? Right, exactly, exactly. It was just, it was an awesome experience and I knew I was gonna be on this panel tonight and I'm like, that's an awesome story that we need to share. Yeah. So. Great. Yeah. How um, would you say, Gentry, that um, being LGBTQ plus affects your job at all? Um, I don't know that it negatively affects my job. I think it actually enhances my job. Um, it, it, you know, we're, you know, evolving as an organization. We've historically been pretty conservative and we've always had business resource groups and volunteer leadership groups, but um, never to the point where we have really had campaigns around diversity and inclusion in the last five years. And, and I think um, it doesn't really affect my job in terms of what I'm expected to do every day. It's enhanced my job in that now I, I think those of us in leadership that are open and out at work, um, you know, tend to be a beacon for people mm -hmm. and they come to us for guidance and solace. And, you know, most people have a coming out story. And they usually go to somebody they trust first on how to do that and get that encouragement. So I think it's affected my job in that it's made me a better people person 
Um, I don't know that it's necessarily made me better at my actual job duties every day, but uh, just being open and out has, has really allowed me to grow personally as well as professionally. Yeah, and help others grow too, right? You sort of paved the way a little bit for them. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Gentry. Sure. Um, Robert, Brid, Brandon, do you, do any of you want to talk about how being a part of the community makes you a better employee? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I love Gentry's point on being a beacon for his fellow employees. And I think that's a really, um, it's a really strong concept, right? I mean, we have this opportunity to be a, uh, a pillar and a uh, sight line for these people who are coming up in their professional lives who otherwise may not have a direction or know who they can speak to uh, for that growth. So I love that, that you're fostering that kind of mentorship feeling. Um, I didn't have a coming out story for work. I just kind of showed up and said, hey, <laughs> ta-da. <laughs> um, but I, I found that when your colleagues know you to be open and authentic and real, they trust you. They just inherently trust you because they can see you at face value. And I think similar to what uh, Gentry was saying, when, when you have that trust, that helps to foster respect between your colleagues and between your partners. And that respect helps for clear and concise ideation when it comes to your work and helping to solve problems together. That process becomes really organic and open. And that's not just like between other folks who are queer, it's between all, all people, right? Like knowing that yeah. you're an authentic self and, and like really being truthful and honest, it, it sort of fosters that community, it sounds like. Right, I, I mean, I feel like our, as far as it affecting the job itself, um, I think as LGBTQ people, we've, gr we've grown up being very self-aware right? We, we've had to uh, kind of put up the defenses, so to speak, so that we know how we're speaking to people, how we're being spoken to, how we, have, how we act in certain situations. And I think that because of that training that we've kind of put on ourselves early on in our lives, it's served as a benefit now in our professional life. We have those soft skills that other people yeah. don't really establish until later on in their professional lives um, of that self-awareness. So I think, um, it then, like you were saying, allows us to work with everyone, even outside of the LGBT community, and know that we have a strong, concise voice and, and that we can be heard. I've never thought about it that way, you know, that, that we have this experience that has been just a part of our lives, whether we wanted it to or not, right? But it has made us not just, you know, better people, but it definitely makes us better employees. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else want to add on to anything Robert said or have, have another um, point of view for how it makes us better employees? Yeah, I, I definitely have to say that I agree with Robert that when you are out and being your authentic self, I, it really helps create an environment where other folks can feel comfortable with being themselves. Uh, I think unfortunately a lot of people are, you know, being yourself is the scariest thing that you can do. And when you are a little bit more different than other folks, it makes it even scarier, but that doesn't mean that um, you shouldn't do it. And, and kind of similar to Pauline, I transitioned on the job too. Uh, so my prior company that I was with, um, it was really scary. I wasn't treated the way that I should be treated. And so when it came time for me getting a new job, I really considered uh, not being out as trans at all because I was at a space where I didn't really have to share. And for a little while, um, I didn't share it. I was uh, what could be referred to as stealth. Um, so I, I hadn't shared my trans identity with any of my coworkers. And uh, the longer that I did that for, the, the less that I just didn't feel good about it. I, it didn't feel comfortable. It didn't feel like I was being myself. And I, did, I felt like I was being deceitful, which is um, an interesting feeling because a lot of folks want to um, make it seem as if trans folks are deceiving people just by pretending to be ourselves. Um, and so when I finally decided to start coming out to my coworkers, it really kind of changed my relationships with them. Um, they would come to me and talk to me about things that they really wouldn't talk to other people about that they were scared to share with other folks. And, and so 
it, it really helped me be a better employee. It helped me be a better friend, a better coworker, uh, just because I was creating a space mm-hmm. just by being myself where other people could be themselves as well. I think that's so important, you know, by us being ourselves and creating that space exactly. It opens the door in more ways than we could ever imagine. Um, was this at the current job that you're at now or was this at a previous job? Yeah, so it was at the previous job that I, I transitioned, didn't have a great experience. And so yeah. when I went into my current position, um, of course, the folks from our, our program knew that I was trans, but I didn't share it with anybody else in, in our administrative office. And I, was, I just kept it very private. Um, and so I, I had decided to just finally be out as, a, as an open and trans, uh, open trans person. And, and so uh, it's been kind of, it's been really nice because I will have other trans folks that work at UCI that are looking for resources or things or, or support. And they know of me and, and they know that they can reach out to me for help. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, they have a space to where they know that they can confide in, in other folks uh, and get some of the things that I might not have had uh, when I was when I was starting my own transition. Yeah, and I would imagine too, like the position that you're in working with gender diversity, right? I would imagine, please correct me if I'm wrong, but having that experience yourself probably really helps you connect with folks that you need to help and um, work through your actual like career with your job day to day. Yeah, absolutely. It's it helps our patients know that they're not the only trans person in the room. Exactly. Awesome. Thank you, Britt. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, I already sort of talked about the next question that we had slated. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip that one about how it affects our jobs, if at all. And I wanna jump right to um, and this has been brought up already. So I'm really happy to dive into this. Like, how much can we be our authentic? how authentic selves at work, you know, how Britt, you had like a really good example of feeling deceitful, not being your authentic self. And, and once you overcame that barrier, it helped you be a better employee and be a better friend, right? And just a human. <laughs> so like, I'm curious how else uh, people experience authenticity in the workplace. And I'd love to hear from um, Brandon or um, maybe Ross who had spoken earlier. Yeah, I can go if you like. Um, this is Brandon. Um, I would say I'm 100% my authentic self at Tinder. Um, I think that's the benefit of being in a tech company and especially a very liberal one like Tinder where I don't have any fears of anything. I definitely can be who I am. I did intern at a previous company called MITRE and they're like a DOD contractor and they were a lot different because they're more government based. Mm-hmm. So I it, that one was kind of like not a hundred percent, but definitely not zero percent. It was just more of like a person by person. But at Tinder, like I'm in the ERG, I participate in everything in the ERG there. I let people know like, hey, the Pride ERG is doing this event. Uh, please participate. We have this trivia. Um, so I, the de- like contrast is definitely different. I feel like that is great for me. I don't have to really walk on eggshells per se and you know like. Do you feel that difference just, between the previous job and this job where like maybe you felt a little bit more eggshell before and now that you can be your authentic self you feel a lot better about it? Yeah 100% especially during Pride Month like Tinder definitely like made a point to say like we were here for you we're, we're doing these things for you and they definitely felt like they were more involved and more authentic versus like my previous one where it's kind of like tone deaf they're just like here's a flyer that's it versus tinder where it was like if you make a donation to these organizations we'll match it and things like that versus the previous one was just like oh yeah like we have one person doing a talk and that's it type mm-hmm. of thing it's like more robots it's more like real mm-hmm. I noticed that you yeah. and Robert both brought up ERG. Can you talk to me a little bit about what ERG is and, and how you're involved? Yeah, so the ERG just means Employee Resource Group. Um, Tinder has a bunch of them, and the one I'm in is the Pride one, which is for the LGBTQ plus uh, community at Tinder, as well as allies. Uh, what we do is we do a variety of things. So um, like during Pride Month, we would host trivia, um, as well as uh, 
transit remembrance or resistance um we would we hosted like a little info session on that and also trivia and with the trivia we also give out like uh, prizes with the option of donating um your prize winning whatever to various uh organizations so like um and tinder will match them as well as when Tinder comes out with new features, um, they will ask the ERG group to participate in a demo, um, give us our opinion, uh, we'll give them our opinion on it and definitely talk like, oh, like I could see this being problematic for mm -hmm. people in our community for this reasons, or I feel like this is very limiting for this reasons, uh, things like that. Yeah, it's um, like you can give them a different perspective. You know, a lot of times, I think that that's one of the way, I work in tech too, and that's one of the ways that like, I feel like that makes us a better employee, right? We have different perspectives. And then we also keep other marginalized groups in mind, I think a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So that's really cool yeah. that they have a program and that they actually, like that Tinder comes to you and, and asks those questions, that's awesome. Yeah. And I think, yeah, because we also think a lot about marginalized groups, we also think of like the safety features, mm -hmm. uh, things like, I think maybe if like, you're just a rape like cis straight white man like yeah that's fine but like if you're anyone else like that can might be an issue and that can cause a lot of problems for that individual yeah exactly <laughs> great all right thank you brandon um thank who you. else wants to talk about their authentic self in the workplace i'll go <laughs> Or oh, I can give the opportunity to somebody else. Did I hear somebody else? Sure, I'll go. Go for it. So, um, I don't know if there's such thing of more than 100%. 100%. <laughs> 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 but, but yeah, it's I'm definitely 100% out there as my authentic self. However, I, I do want to say that, um, and I think a lot of trans folks can, can, can attest, at least the trans folks that, probably closer to my age or older. Uh, I, I, do, I don't want to take credit where credit's not due. Um, I pick and choose um, qualities and experiences from my prior life and I incorporate it into this life, but I, I, keep, that, I keep that separate because, mm -hmm. um, and I do it, do it for myself. It's all, only for therapeutic reasons. Um, simply because with those qualities comes baggage that I don't want to relive again or don't want to remember. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that the younger generation, they're out and you know they, they transition a lot, a lot sooner. Um, it took me years to figure this out. <laughs> and finally, when I, when I found out what it was, I was suppressing it. I was like, no. <laughs> But um, and still having to go to work and like deal yeah. with everything day to day, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm so I'm really careful picking out those qualities and experiences. Um, so so I like to use what what I call the Lego Lego analogy. So I'm sure everybody here has had Legos when they were young. So picture like yourself toys, like the little Lego toys. Yeah, the little Lego. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. <laughs> so, so, you have this bucket of Legos that you played when you're with a play with when you were a kid, and then now you get this new bucket of Legos with, you know, you, you can make a castle or, or a house or whatever, and and you build it and you realize, oh, I'm missing one piece. Actually, I'm missing several pieces. Where do I get those Lego pieces from? So you have to reach into the other box and you pop them in, and they just kind of stand out from the castle or the house that you just made, you know, because they're old and they're grimy or different color or whatever. But you need those qualities yeah. to complete yourself. But people like, I don't want to say people my age, because I'm dating myself, but um, people who transition later in life, they need, they still need those qualities, but sometimes they want to create that buffer in between just, just to protect themselves from, from that history. Yeah. I and mean, I think everybody can identify with that, right? It's like, my best friend, for example, she's cisgender, she's um, white, she's straight. She still is, like, she's the most private person I've ever met, right? And she doesn't have the same sort of baggage or, you know, different Lego blocks like you're talking about. So there's a level of that I feel like everybody can identify with, but I think it, when we have these um, marginalized experiences, it's a lot more extreme and it's a lot more prevalent, right? So it, it, I'm sure that that, like, kind of affects... Um, 
Yeah, I, I agree. Um, there was one thing I wanted to bring up, uh, and I, I promised myself that I'd actually bring it up during this meeting. So, and, and it was one of the questions that we kind of skipped. It was more of the how it affects your job, and I thought that was a yeah, really go for it. question because um, I, 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 I kind of have an interesting perspective of what's going on. Um, and, and I guess the best way to do it is to just talk pre-transition, post-transition. Pre-transition wasn't, I wasn't really challenged on any any of the, the uh, of the decisions I've ever made. And like in the workplace, you mean like when you, when you said like, this is it, blah, 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 whatever, in a meeting or whatever? Correct. Uh -huh. And the responsibilities that were given to me seem to have been given to me without merit or any kind of certification of any kind. And I never really thought twice about it. And then come post transition, now it's a little bit of a different story. Um, now my decisions seem to be challenged a little bit more mm -hmm. and responsibilities, not my actual work, but my responsibilities that I've held in the past seem to have disappeared or I have to fight for them a little bit more. And, um, you know, I, I thought that was really interesting. So even today, even to this day, I'm still kind of fighting it um, with individuals that that never have known me pre-transition and don't know that I'm transgender. Um, and it, it's very frustrating. So, and it's sadly enough, and, I, and I'm really hesitant to say this, but sadly enough, it, it seems to be coming from a lot of males. <laughs> I think, I mean, and that's what, kind of what was that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was, I thought it was a mute. I said, boys will be boys. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's, you know, that's kind of, you know, what Pauline's saying and what I was going to say too. Like, it's, it's the, it's the male privilege, right? And uh, that happens in the workplace a lot. And so that's, that is such a wild experience for somebody who's a trans woman, right? Going from maybe having that privilege to no longer having that privilege. And I mean, it's, it's freaking real, right? <laughs> uh, you, you, you I, I think, like I said it earlier, I never really gave it much thought until it actually started to happen to me. And then I started to realize, and, and, and I'm not knocking cis women at all, but I think a lot of cis women are used to seeing that. And I think so too. It's like, it, you know, the males are used to it. That you don't know any better, basically. Yeah. Right? Like you don't have both sides of the experience like somebody right. like yourself. So, so then all of a sudden when I start to challenge it, all of a sudden I'm a, I'm a B word. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm, I just don't think this is right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been told how to dress. Yeah. You know? It's like, what? <laughs> This is 2019. It was like last year. So yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's a really, really incredible point. All right. Does anybody else have like any really um, specific things they want to talk about in terms of being your authentic self at work? Does anybody have any struggles, like some deep struggles with it? I don't, I don't have any deep struggles with being my authentic self at work. Um, but sometimes it can be too much too fast, especially if you're in a conservative or larger organization that doesn't move that quick or doesn't take on you know, social change as rapidly as they should. Um, and for some people that you know, are, are digging in or dragging their feet or it could even be senior executives that are you know, late to get on board mm -hmm. um, you know, with their beliefs or where, you know, where we're driving the company. And honestly, those people aren't around very long, but they're still there. So there's some roadblocks where there may be a lack of comfort for some people to be their true and honest self. Just like, you know, Paulina's saying, it's, she's 100% at work, but it is, there is that fear of, yeah, I'm okay to be LGBTQ plus and out, but can I really come with rainbow hair? And is that okay to work in one of our offices with customers? And, you know, the standards that we even have for employees have evolved over the last just five or six years to become more inclusive and become more accommodating and um, allowing people to do that. So I think, I, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, you can't be your authentic self at work. You just got to be aware that others may not be ready for it. Yeah, yeah. I, that's a really good point too. And I, you sort of touched on something that I wanted to say out loud too. It's like, 
even when we are our authentic selves at work, we have that fear sometimes still, right? That it will affect us in the negative way or that somebody will say something or, you know, it, it's, I think it's like that thing that's sort of always in the back of our mind. Like, even if we feel like we can be a hundred percent authentic, it's still like, oh, well, oops. yeah. Or something like, <laughs> right? Do you know what I mean? Right. Or will they remember that when it's time for a promotion or for bonus decisions or something down the road? Yeah. Yeah. So. Exactly. Good, good points. I, 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 what, what do we call it now? Unconscious bias. Yep. Unconscious bias. Right. Exactly. After, so it's, I think it's really important for people to be trained in that. I've been like, I have to, I'm a UX, user experience researcher. Like, I, I research for a living and I have to really fight my unconscious biases and I've been trained in that sort of thing and I think if every person in the world took it it would be amazing <laughs> right, right exactly yeah all right um so then what are some critical changes that we need to make to to face the future effectively like what are some things that we can do now um to help further our community in the workplace right now Well, I, um, in, in establishing the ERG, noticed that there were some significant shortcomings with how we supported our LGBTQ employees. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have heard of the, the human rights campaign uh, equality, um, the corporate equality index, and that that's for companies to strive for that equality across the board, be it through um, health benefits or how you treat your employees in general and uh, employee protections and things like that. That's like a thing that you can get from the HRC. It's like a document or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's actually a certification that you receive from HRC and they essentially audit uh, your company's business practices and then they you receive a score out of 100%. And those scores are... Um, widely published I mean, anyone who has interest in it can look it up and find out oh this company only has a score of 50 percent whereas this one has a score of 100 percent that's awesome i didn't know about that actually yeah it's it's an excellent driver for um for customers if if uh lgbtq um rights and equality are important to them they can find out what companies do or do not support the lgbt community um and i think it, when it first started, it was just kind of like a who's who, like, oh, great, good job. But now in this socially aware, um, social media fueled um, kind of society that we're living in, it's more important than ever, especially to younger generations when we're realizing that all of their purchasing dollars are made on the decision of what the company is doing for the common good. So I realized that within uh, Taco Bell or a larger corporate company, Yum, which oversees like Pizza Hut and KFC and The Habit. Um, but with Taco Bell and Hey Yum specifically, we found that there were some significant shortcomings. And so we've been working toward that. Um, the biggest one that I think we're facing is um, just to make sure that we're, we're listening to the needs of our trans employees and um, making sure that what is needed is given to them. And specifically, I, I, I can share that Taco Bell or Yum has an 80% out of 100. And that's partly because uh, for a while, we did not offer equal coverage to our trans employees when it comes to healthcare and um, uh, financial assistance when it comes to transitioning or being able to take time off of work during that transition period. Um, I can now say that we do offer that, which is excellent. So we were able to bring our score up. Um, but that's the kind of, that's the kind of work it, that I think all companies should be doing. They should be looking internally and seeing where, where are we missing the mark and where can we make those adjustments, be it with, um, trans equality with health benefits or just general equity when it comes to domestic partnerships versus marriage. A, a married gay couple may be treated differently than a gay couple in a domestic partnership. And why is that? And where can those changes be? So I think uh, it's, it's really important for companies to take that look inside and see where those changes can be made to be better. Yeah. Do you have any tips on, you know, like 
what if I'm, you know, just the person working the desk, right? Like, I don't know how I can get that started. Do you have any tips on, on how to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was, that was kind of me, really. I, <laughs> I showed up to work. I've only been to Taco Bell for about a year and a half. Um, and my first six months, I really threw myself into the culture. We're a really culture-driven brand. Um, but in doing that, realizing, yeah, I'm, I'm authentic and I'm here and I'm myself, but I'm still, I, I don't see that um, camaraderie, that representation, that um, internal, yeah, there's that ad additional step that was missing. And it wasn't just for LGBTQ. We, we had an opportunity to develop uh, ERGs for women and for Latinx and for our Asian communities. And we didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, um, just spoke to the needed, uh, spoke to the people that I needed to reach out to HR representatives, reach out and, um, found our diversity and inclusion management and just sent them an email and said, listen, we have an opportunity and are there other companies doing this? Yes, but we don't want to just copy them. How can we make it Taco Bell's version of how, how do we make sure that this is part of our business voice, but we're also serving our community um, through fellowship and through visibility and through support. Um, so it takes a lot of time. It took about a year for us to get up off the ground, but i um, excited to say we started our um, Moss Pride ERG in June. And um, within the six months after that, we already had another five established for wow. women, Latinx, uh, for Asians, for uh, Black Americans. So it's really exciting. And there's more to come. Like everyone just gets really excited about being able to begin their own group and educate and advocate and activate and get people excited. Yeah, it brings velocity. It brings change. Um, that's, that's rad. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Did you just say rad? I did. <laughs> rad. I say dope and rad all the time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, I want to jump on Robert's point. I think he's absolutely right. Um, but I also want to go back on Gentry's point. There's still a lot of um, conservative, and, and I'm going to say it, Gen Xers still in the workplace. Um, and we're moving from that uh, Gen X to the millennials where they're going to start taking the reins. And I, I think that having the right mindset and being more inclusive is, is absolutely important. Um, when we started off with the, um, um, the HRC index, we, we started off with the 20. Um, and then this fabulous person by the name of Megan Cooper came around and she, uh, she, she had me help her uh, start off the WeEco group, our BRGs. Uh, I'm sorry, we, we call them now BRGs. Back then we called them ERGs. Um, What's the difference between a BRG and an ERG? Is there any? The, not really. ERG is obviously employee research group. The BRG is business research group. So we're, we're giving also back to the business as well. You know, we need the business's uh, help in order to, to continue with our affinity groups. But um, what, I, what I really wanted to say was I wanted, I wanted to start changing the mindset of from tolerance to acceptance. Mm -hmm. the, the tolerance, uh, I mean, you can't have acceptance without tolerance, but you, but you can't have it the other way around. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people, especially the Gen Xers, they, they, that are very conservative, they, they think just being tolerant is okay when it really isn't, because you can still be biased and you can still be prejudicial. And in their mind, they're thinking, I'm accepting no, that's not accepting. <laughs> you just being... I, if I remember correctly, like there was a move, like a tolerance movement a while back, right? Like, yeah, and, and that so maybe that mindset has like really set in, and they feel like that's what they've learned. And I could be totally wrong, but um, now it's time to take the next step, right? Now, now I think we need to graduate from that. We need to graduate into the acceptance portion. Yeah, and the people that are going to do it are going to be the uh, millennials and. But is it the Gen Zers that are next? Mm -hmm. Gen Y? Gen Z. Mm -hmm. Whoever's next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Great. Um, all right. Well, I know that we're at time, but I think our conversation is going really well. Um, Jackie, if you want to jump in or I, I would like to keep going and, and wrap up with um, this last question here. If anybody needs to go, please feel free to drop off. Um, don't forget to put your information in the chat so that we can reach out to you. Um, and, and you will get a, a follow-up survey uh, that's really important to us. So um, that will be sent out tomorrow too. But, all right, so how are y'all advocating for the LGBTQ community at work? You know, we've talked a lot about the ERGs um, and the HRC Equality Index. Um, are there any other ways or does anybody else want to talk about the way that they utilize those two things as well? Yeah, I'd be happy to talk. It actually kind of blends into both of those things, the, the healthcare equality index and, and advocating. Uh, so UCI finally, after uh, about a decade of uh, our previous medical director trying to get UCI to finally join the uh, healthcare quality index. We finally did this year. Um, and so we, we scored 100 out of 100, but that doesn't mean that the work is done. Uh, and that doesn't mean that's, true, that, right? that's where it ends. Uh, we found quite a bit of ways that we fall short for the LGBTQ community. But what was really important uh, as an outcome from that is that we developed a LGBTQ committee that's in charge of implementing changes throughout the entire healthcare system. And I've been, I've been pretty proud of the fact that I was um, nominated as the, the co-chair for that committee. And so I awesome. work directly with other folks that are within UCI to create change that is going to impact not just our, our patients, but our employees and really just working to create an environment that is more LGBT inclusive and that access to care is going to be improved and that employees are going to feel like they're supported. So it's um, the work is not over. There's a lot to do, but it changes is a tortoise and that and that just is something that we have to keep working towards. So. Right. Yeah. And developing new ways to do it too. Right. You know, it's like, yes, we, maybe we have this index and that's great to get 100, but like you said, there's always new things to do. Maybe there's more that needs to be added to that. There's more ways that we can innovate and 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 help folks all the time, right? The work is never done. That's for darn sure. <laughs> Anybody else? How how are how are y'all advocating? I'll jump in again. <laughs> so um, after after we started the the BRG groups. Um, and especially with our We Equal group, you know, the founding members are pretty much all gone. I think I'm the last one left. Thanks, Megan. Um, <laughs> and, and so we have new members now and they have all these new ideas. So I'm kind of like taking a back step and letting them run with it. But one thing that I'm trying to do right now is, is bridge that gap between the LGBT community and our TA group, our talent acquisition group. Um, we had a meeting with the, the VP of talent acquisition. And um, he, he set out the challenge, um, find that connection for me into the group. And I think that, that the centers um, are, are the best advocates for it. Um, I'm still trying to work out the details, but I, I, what I really wanna do is, is help bring talent from the LGBT community into the company through the center. Um, that way, we have a continuous uh, like a line line. of folks yeah. uh, jumping into the tech world, especially into a, a, what was once a really conservative company. These changes are happening. And we, whether we like them or we don't, these changes are happening. And that's the, I think that's the only way to bring them in because there's still a lot of LGBT folks that don't have good jobs and they're heck of smart. Right. Not that word, but heck of smart. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really great point too, Pauline. And that, um, you know, that is intersectional too, right? Across um, different marginalized groups. So there's always that sort of corporate argument of like, well, the talent's not there, right? And that is wrong. We all know that's wrong. It's just that they're not looking in the right place. So that's super commendable that you're doing that at your, um, at your employer. And I would love to, you know, see other other people doing that. Do you have any any tips on on how um, people can start? You know, um, I don't. I'm, I'm not in town acquisition. 
Um, but um, send me your resumes. <laughs> send, <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> log in. Log into the company, um, a company job site or our careers, and you know, I, I've noticed that HR when they put these jobs out, they, they, they put it out, the, the description of the jobs according to what the, what the hiring manager puts. Right. But that's all fluff. Yeah. You know, it may seem intimidating, but it really isn't. Um, put those applications and put myself down, even if you don't know me yet, put myself down as somebody that you know, and we'll talk later, just so that we can get you into the company. Yeah, and I think that's a good point too. You made you touched on two things that I think are really important from both sides of it, right? Is the the language that's used and the from the talent acquisition, from the career websites, things like that. There's like a lot of times really technical stuff and, and a lot of fluff. And that needs to change, right? On one side of things, make jobs more accessible to everybody, not just people that know those words. And um, then on the other side of things, it's like put yourself out there. Even if you aren't a hundred percent qualified for the job, reach out to somebody on LinkedIn that works there. Talk to them about it. Right. Apply anyways, right? Like don't be afraid. The The worst they can do is you, you don't get that job. You already didn't have that job. Right. So, <laughs> but, but yeah, exactly. But the, you know what they're going to ask, even in the next position that you apply for, everybody pretty much asks the same question. So yeah. now you know what they might ask next time. Exactly. So yeah, put it in, put your applications in. <laughs> All right, does anybody else have any um, final thoughts about advocating for us at the, in the workplace before we move on to some Q&A? I would just say that, you know, just, you know, live your, your, your true identity, your true self um, for everyone. Um, we all have a coming out story, well, most of us do. I remember how it was coming out to my parents and uh, and then family and then friends and how uncomfortable it might have been at first, but then it just made our my relationships with everyone better. Mm -hmm. And I've experienced the same thing over uh, in the financial services industry. Yes, it's a conservative uh, industry uh, at times, uh, but there is, you know, humans working there. And I think at the end of the day, we just have to remember that we're only human. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, and that kind of, ties back to where we started, right? You know, coming out of, out of work stories and, and being our authentic selves, like the more that we can do that, just, just by creating that space, right? It helps create space for others and it helps move things forward. Even though change is a tortoise, <laughs> right? Um, it, the tortoises still move and, and we can be a part of that. We can be a vehicle for change, so awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Jackie, and I think we're going to open the floor for some Q&A. Thank you so much, Brenna and everybody. There I am. Um, I, I'm not sure if I, I think there's some, a lot of comments going around, all great things. I know, Sean, you had a, you had a question, but I think people answered it. <laughs> um, but I'm not sure if anybody else wants to um, write a question in the chat or has any questions, please feel free to make yourself known and, and, and pull up your video or your audio if you do have any last final questions or comments. Yeah, and I think it's fine if you have a, a question for a specific panelist or a question um, that maybe you don't really understand something we talked about, like the floor is open. Like there are no, there are no stupid questions. <laughs> Hey, Jackie, this is Megan. Um, Hi, Megan. I'm really curious. Uh, I also work in financial services. And I'm curious how, as an ally, how can I help um, push the company forward and, you know, really try to support um, maybe initiatives that are underlying but aren't, you know, actually happening yet? That's a great question, Megan. I don't know, Rafa or Gentry, if one of you would like to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can jump in. Um, so um, if, you know, if you're an ally already through like an ERG or a BRG, making yourself known as part of that group is the biggest part of the battle. Because, um, you know, that's, we need allies, right? At, at, at Chase, and I know, uh, you know a lot of companies that have BRGs, 
the membership is not limited to the target group, right? So all groups have allies. So there's lots of cis folks that are in the pride group at Chase. And when they are uh, open and uh, talk uh, and sharing information via email or serving on um, you know, committees throughout the company and sharing what they do outside of their day job as being, you know, a leadership role within a BRG, for example, that happens to be pride and they're not LGBT, that kind of conversation is what really does just their presence and their position adds the advocacy there. Uh, allows the education to happen and then the involvement happens. So um, it, it I, I don't know that there is a checklist you could do, but it is very organic. It's just making sure people are aware um, who you are and what you care about. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, we have a question here from Sean Hernandez. Do you feel, uh, where is it? Do you feel working remotely has increased or decreased LGBTQ inclusion or stayed the same, maybe? Very relevant question. <laughs> yes. Interesting. I'm trying to think like uh, uh, offhand, it's increased inclusion, but that's only because that's when we chose to start our ERG. Um, but I think in a, um, in just a, a general sense, I don't know, it's hard to feel included when everything that you're doing is virtual, right? All the connections that you're making with people. I, I like to think that I've made connections with everyone here, but at the same time, I'm stuck behind this, this black mirror and not really <laughs> touching it or seeing anyone. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's influenced it positively or negatively. I think it really depends on, on the company and the culture. I, we've worked really hard to make sure that despite we're all working from home at Taco Bell, uh, but despite that, we've worked really hard to make sure that that culture is still alive, if not growing. And I, I was talking with the panelists before we started and saying that like, I just spent the last hour finding fun Christmas themed virtual activities that we could all do together that is sponsoring that we can invite and still feel like part of a family that we're going out instead of the traditional annual Christmas party or white elephant gift exchange and things like that. Um, and I, I feel like that's part of it too. You try to find those moments where you can, even though we're far apart, still feel included, still feel part of a community, still feel like part of a culture. Yeah, I work for a company that is, I, I'm always remote. That's even before the pandemic. So um, I found that I found that it's, I think it's just the place I work. Like it's an amazingly inclusive um, company, but like being able to connect with people on Slack and like use the pride flag emoji <laughs> or like re react to things. And like, we have a special Slack channel, like that's called, so I work at answer lab. So everything is like something lab. Um, so it's like ally lab and um, you know, whether you're an ally or a part of the community, like that's the place to go to talk about, um, to talk about marginalized groups and um, and also being able to put up like my Slack status, like oftentimes I'll use um, the pride flag or the trans flag, um, like on the trans day of remembrance, I use that. And I think it, it brings visibility, right? It's carving out that space. Um, it, it makes me feel more connected and it makes me feel more like I can be my authentic self and like literally let my flag fly, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I can comment too. Um, I started during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I don't know how office life was at Tinder before the <laughs> pandemic, but I do know that they do a lot of like, like happy hour and mixers where they'll actually have like a vendor send alcohol or mocktails and we sit on Zoom for an hour talking about anything and everything, our cats, our dogs, uh, what we did over the weekend. And, um, and, it's, and it's open for everyone. You just need to obviously like fill out a sign up sheet so you get your mocktail or cocktail and you just share a drink with everyone. And I, I feel like I'm very fortunate too because Tinder is very inclusive too. So, so it's super fun, but 
I think it increased. I can't tell. I wasn't there before the pandemic, but from my feeling, I feel like it's definitely living strong. I feel like it's kind of a theme of the pandemic, right? It's like, we're all just sort of like, F it, like, I'm going to be myself, like, the world is ending or whatever it may be, right? I think we all sort of feel like, I'm going to wear pajama pants every day because I can't. I'm going to be gay at work because I can't, because what am I about to lose, right? So it's like, <laughs> it might not necessarily be like, because of the transition to remote, it might just be like, the fabric of what's happening in life right now, too. <laughs> The, li the literal stretch pant fabric of your life. <laughs> I know, I'm feeling that right now, actually. But we'll be continuing this next year. So, you know, stay tuned. Um, uh, like Brenna mentioned, we're going to be sending out a uh, post-event survey. If you do fill it out, you'll obviously help us, but you will also enter a raffle for a $50 Amazon card. Woo! Who doesn't like Amazon? So, um, so yeah, if you can fill it out um, in the next week or so, no worry, no, no deadline there. But uh, I wanted to thank everybody for your time. Um, I do wanna obviously invite everyone to learn more about the LGBTQ Center of Orange County. Um, we are lucky enough to work and collaborate with all these panelists here. And um, I do wanna say that um, I, I started working at the center around June, which is around the time that I met Robert as well. And I have to say it's been really impressive to see people that you see here in the panel and, the, and inclusive of, of Brenna. It takes people like this, right? Passionate people to kind of be outside of their comfort zone, be like, okay, you know, I am who I am, I'm confident, now what? And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing people who are not just, you know, you know have worked on themselves. It's like they're actually giving back to the community, truly uh, making the change in their workplace. You know, you heard it from Robert, you know, he was the one that went up to them and said, hey, we got to make this change. So it starts, it starts with us, right? We want to make that change. Um, I know when I think about myself and I think about having a family in, in a few years, you know, and, and building a home for, for my family here in Orange County, how do I make, make sure that my children are going to be uh, feeling like themselves, right? So everybody has their own reason why they do what they do. But I think um, at the end of the day, again, not to sound su super cheesy, but you know, we want to give back to the community and um, I hope that you've been inspired in one way or another. Um, you've obviously met some great people that will definitely connect everybody with. Um, and we're here. Uh, feel free to email us, uh, contact us on social media. If you do have any ideas, we're here to support the way that you are going to advocate however you choose to do so. We're here to help with that. <laughs>